start with this one. Here's a young child with a heel mass. All right, and here's a, I'll just kind of go through these myself. Here's a T1 weighted image. And what you see here is a complex fatty mass in the heel of a young child. Okay, any ideas what this might be? Well, it's not a very common tumor, honestly, but the, the, uh, the, what you have to keep in mind is that if you have in a young kid what looks like a complex fatty mass, it's usually going to be a lipoblastoma because most, uh, because liposarcomas are going to be really exceedingly rare in infants and kids. Uh, it's a rare tumor, though, but just keep that in mind if you see something like that in a kid, particularly if the kid's like really young, under three months of age, and quite honestly, probably under 10, but most people say under three months of age. Here's a 55-year-old man with a superficial posterior neck mass. Here's on T1 weighted image. Yeah, maybe it's mostly fat, but yeah, I don't know. On proton density weighted image with fat saturation, there are definitely some areas there that are not fat signal intensity. And here it is, it enhances. So you can't just call that a simple fatty tumor. You can't just call that a lipoma. Fortunately, this is an issue of, of the patient's sex, age, and real estate. You see a complex fatty mass in the subcutaneous tissues of the posterior neck of a middle-aged man. Um, you can never be 100% sure, but this is a very, very good picture for something that's fairly recently described called the spindle cell lipoma. And this is a lipoma variant uh, that typically presents in men. There's a 9 to 1 male to female ratio between the ages of 45 and 65 years. And the imaging appearance is not pathognomonic, but is really highly suggestive if you have a middle-aged man who pre presents with a well-defined complex fatty mass in the subcutaneous tissues, especially when localized to the posterior neck. And then I'll, I'll let you guys struggle with this one for a little bit. This is an elderly woman with a painless shoulder mass. Oh, okay. I already heard someone mention it. All right, so what do we have here? Well, we have a complex fatty mass between the lower scapula. Here you see this, the Y of the scapula here. And the chest wall in an elderly woman. Here's the mass right here is the chest wall. And so I heard someone say the diagnosis of elastofibroma. It's actually a pseudotumor. It presents as a mass between the lower scapula and the chest wall, usually in late adulthood. Many patients report a history of intensive manual labor, and so it's thought to be perhaps a reaction to chronic friction. But it's seen in about, uh, in autopsy data, almost a, a fifth of patients. More commonly unilateral, but can be bilateral. The lesion contains fat and fibrous tissue. Sometimes the fibrous tissue is more overwhelming than the fat. And there are some other rare locations that occurs, the neck, the ischial tuberosity, and the elbow and the knee. But this very, very typical location here just deep to the tip of the scapula for an elastofibroma. And you can pick these up on chest CTs, too. A young adult with a forearm mass. T1 weighted image. There's a stir axial image. So looking at these, anyone have any ideas what this could be? Okay, I heard a couple people mention it. So you have a deep heterogeneous mass, but there are definitely areas of high signal intensity similar to fat in this lesion. On T2 weighted images, you have high signal intensity mass with several small foci of signal void. And this is a hemangioma. It's the most common soft tissue lesion, it's the most common vascular lesion, and the most common tumor in infants and children. These lesions are often often intermediately change in size. They can be painful. The overlying skin can be blue, and they can dramatically increase in size during pregnancy. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on the classification system because it's confusing and it varies widely, but basically you have capillary, cavernous, venous, and arteriovenous varieties. Capillary is the most common um, soft tissue angiominous lesion. This is infrequently evaluated radiologically. This is the one where babies get on their face, for example. Most commonly involves the skin and subcutaneous tissues, and oftentimes will involute by uh, childhood. The cavernous variety is the one that we encounter the most frequently. Frequently involves the deeper intramuscular uh, soft tissues. They don't involute and can require surgical resection. They're seen in young children, young adults, and you can see phleboliths. Arteriovenous hemangiomas are persistence of the, represent a persistence of the fetal capillary bed with abnormal communication of arteries and veins. They can be superficial, in which case they're usually clinically insignificant, or deep, in which case they're frequently symptomatic. And finally, venous hemangiomas, generally found in adults, but Musculoskeletal radiologists usually don't deal with them. They're more frequently in the retroperitoneum and mesentery. So on T1-weighted images, the key uh, to, to making the diagnosis is you see a, 
low to intermediate signal intensity mass, but it contains areas of high signal intensity due to fat overgrowth, predominantly peripherally, but uh, can kind of form these septations within the, the lesion as well, and very uh, infiltrative uh, fat appearance. And some areas can really be indistinguishable for, from lipoma. On T2-weighted images, you'll see areas that show very high signal intensity due to vascular tissue. Uh, other reasons are isointense relative to the fat, and you have the so-called central low-intensity dot sign, very highly specific for hemangioma. It's actually thought to be due to uh, fast flow in one of the vessels there. Uh, sometimes these foci of signal voids may be due to phleboliths. You see a bunch of little small foci here. Some of them probably fast vessels, but some of them probably re represent little phleboliths, little uh, vessel calcifications that we see on radiographs. Uh, the vascular channels have a very characteristic circular, linear, serpentine appearance with either high or low signal intensity depending on the pulse sequence and how fast the blood is flowing, and they do enhance after gadolinium. Another example of a mangioma with a sort of ill-defined fat appearance on T1-weighted images. Here it is on T2-weighted images. You can see a big vessel in there as well. Another hemangioma. You can see the infiltrating fat, particularly peripherally, but going into it, and then a couple little vascular structures, maybe a low-intensity dot sign there on the T2-weighted images. All right, this person has injury to the knee two to three weeks ago. So here is a T2-weighted image. I think everyone can see the abnormality up here. Here's a T1-weighted image with fat saturation, but the patient was not given gadolinium. So pretty much only one thing this could be. Anyone have an idea? Well, what are some things that can be high signal intensity on a T1-weighted image with fat saturation where you haven't given contrast? Yeah, okay. So. On a T2-weighted image, you see this high signal intensity mass within a superpatellar pouch. And there's a surrounding rim of low signal intensity, so that might be your first clue. And then on this T1-weighted image, with fat saturation without, gas, uh, without GAD, this mass maintained its high signal intensity. So if you recall your chart on what hematomas look like and how uh, age is going to influence the MRI appearance, remember that in the late subacute phase, um, where you have your uh, methemoglobin that's been lysed, you can have very high signal intensity on T1-weighted images and T2-weighted images, so this was a soft tissue hematoma. The high signal intensity on T1-weighted images adds specificity, but again, it's not present in all the stages. Uh, you can certainly use fat suppression to exclude tumors that contain fat. Uh, the, uh, this can mimic a tumor, of course, but usually it evolves. It gets smaller over time as opposed to tumors, which get larger, uh, but it can evolve pretty slowly. This was just a, a, a nice little case we had a patient who had a fatty mass here that was biopsied because there were some other areas that showed some uh, thicker septa. And then after the biopsy, a little while later, developed this. And I'm like, well, wow, is that another part of the, the fatty mass? What's going on there? Well, we get our T1-weighted images with fat saturation and no GAD. The fatty mass uh, dropped out completely in signal where this got bright. So this was a hematoma that was simply from the biopsy. Look at another soft tissue mass, a 32-year-old man with several month history of gradually enlarging mass in the thigh, otherwise healthy. So we're given T1, T2, and T1 weighted images with contrast. So let's kind of go through these. I'll have to show you some other, other pictures here too. So you're thinking in your mind, perhaps some sort of tumor. Here we see on CT scan, doesn't really add much, but what the CT does add is on this slide. The remainder of the chest and abdomen and pelvis CT is normal. So what do we have? We have a large mass anterior to and adjacent to the proximal femur near the hip joint. That's a clue. Um, it's mostly hypo-intense relative to fat on T1-weighted images, but there is this area of high signal intensity that matched another area of high signal intensity on T2-weighted images, so that was, it turns out this is hemorrhage right here. So we have a mass that has some blood in it, still not particularly specific. T2-weighted images is very heterogeneous, has areas of high signal intensity, low signal intensity, intermediate signal intensity. Again, doesn't, it's not really specific, but it's typical for this particular, uh, this particular entity here and the mass enhances following intravenous gadolinium. What's interesting, though, 
is that there's lymphadenopathy along the iliac chain, medial to the left psoas muscle, and no additional lymphadenopathy anywhere else in this patient, just there. So let's summarize what we have. We have a large, slow-growing, heterogeneous, enhancing mass arising near the left hip joint of a 32-year-old man, young guy, abutting the anterior aspect of the proximal femur, and there's some lymphadenopathy. Well, we have to include soft tissue sarcoma in the differential in this patient. It's a young patient, but you have to do it. What are the most common soft tissue sarcomas? Well, malignant fibrous histiocytoma is the most common soft tissue sarcoma of late adult life. This term is kind of being phased out because with improved cytogenetics, pathologists are starting to classify uh, what had been previously thought to be malignant fibrohistiocytomas into other lesions such as pleomorphic liposarcomas and, and whatnot. What are some other common lesions uh, of adult uh, or, or other common soft tissue sarcomas? Liposarcomas, as we showed already, lyomyosarcomas. These also usually present in middle-aged and elderly people. So this guy's a little young for that. Yeah. Rhabdomyosarcoma, how about that? Well, unlike most soft tissue sarcomas, it can metastasize by lymphangitic spread. However, these usually occur in infants and children. We do get a few every now and then occur in adults. But the key, the key points here, the most common soft tissue sarcoma is still this malignant fibrous histiocytoma, but that occurs in late adult life. Most soft tissue sarcomas do not metastasize by lymphangitic spread. And rhabdomyosarcoma can metastasize by lymphagic spread, but it's, again, uncommon to occur in adults. Now, there's a group of uh, sarcomas, and there's a point to all this, uh, that have been referred to as the epithelioid or polygonal cells uh, tumors of soft tissues. They tend to affect adolescents and young adults arising mostly within the extremities. They have a relatively high frequency of, relative, uh, of regional lymph node involvement, which, again, is a finding that's pretty uncommon with most soft tissue sarcomas. And these include synovial sarcoma and a few others. But the important one here that we're going to talk about is synovial sarcoma, uh, which is what this case was. Now, this represents actually 10% of primary malignant soft tissue tumors. So soft tissue tumors aren't all, malignant soft tissue tumors aren't all that common, but this is a relatively common one within that uh, group of tumors. They're of uncertain pathogenesis. They typically arise in adolescents and young adults with a peak incidence between 20 and 40 years of age, and they frequently arise in soft tissues nearby, but very rarely within large joints. So here you have an example of one. It's not in the joint. It's posterior to the capsule. There you can see the capsule. It's not in the joint, but it's posterior to it. Uh, you can see calcifications, uh, about, about a third of them on radiographs, MRI. Uh, typically shows some areas of hemorrhage within the synovial sarcoma, as you see here. On T2-weighted images, uh, you can get all sorts of different areas, including hypo-intense areas, uh, as well as intermediate and high-signal intensity areas. Some people call this a triple signal sign. Um, it's thought to be due to uh, the hypo-intensity is due to areas of fibrosis and hyper-intense areas uh, due to cysts and hemorrhage on T2-weighted images. Now. The, the reason why I'm bringing this up, and this is an actual case, and we see a case like this every year, it seems like, not necessarily with the bad results I'm about to show you, but you'll see a mass here. This is a very, very common location for these sarcomas in the fat pad of Hoffa, just posterior to the infrapatellar tendon. Now, this was called a cyst, like, for example, a meniscal cyst. Well, you can see there's some problems with that. Yeah, a lot of it's high signal and almost fluid signal intensity, but there's some areas of uh, low signal intensity within that. Well, the orthopedic surgeon, arthroscopist, read the report, and so he decided to go in there with his arthroscope right through this cyst into the joint. Well, that's bad. Now you've just seated this sarcoma in the patient's joint until you have to take out his knee and fuse his femur and tibia. So pay close attention to these. They're usually not in the joint, but they're near the joint. But if you see a lesion here that's a mass, um, it can look very, very cystic, but on post-contrast images, and I know that you know, we don't routinely do post-contrast images in the knee, but there's sometimes there, there are appropriate times to suggest it. Um, if particularly if you see a mass in Hoffa's fat pad, it does not look like it's associated with a meniscal tear or, or a ganglion from one of the cruciate ligaments, for example. Consider these. They, uh, cysts should not enhance, or at least, at least if they do, they'll only have a little bit of peripheral enhancement. Synovial sarcomas, however, will enhance. These patients have a uh, 60 to 75 percent five-year survival rate, which isn't terrible, but what's uh, kind of sad is they have a much poorer 10 to 15-year survival rate. So it's not unusual for these patients to actually die of metastatic disease 20 years after the initial presentation. 
Um, other soft tissue masses within large lymph nodes, of course, which could be in our differential metastatic carcinoma or lymphoma, can spread to non-nodal soft tissues and, of course, infections. Uh, here's a kind of fun case. This is a 25-year-old woman with lateral left thigh pain and a palpable mass. Here's a T1 coronal image. You can see over here something going on. Let's take a look at it on axial images. This is a T2 axial image with fat saturation. Okay, did not look like fat on the T1 weighted image, so that this is, it's it's dark, but it's not fat. And then here's a T1 weighted axial image, uh, fat saturation after gadolinium, and I'll tell you that it did enhance a little bit after uh, after gadolinium administration. So what do we see? Let's look at this carefully. You have a small mass that's in the vastus lateralis muscle. On T1, it has this little hypo-intense rim. Okay, on T2, it's predominantly hypo-intense and has a little bit of surrounding edema. And then on T2 weighted, excuse me, T1-weighted fat-saturated images with gadolinium, it enhances a little bit and has a persistent hypo-intense rim. Well, let's think about this for a while. We have a, a lesion with decreased signal intensity on T2-weighted images. That's a little bit unusual. Most tumors that we see have predominantly increased signal on T2-weighted images. So let's talk about things that can cause decreased signal intensity. Well, you can have fibrous lesions because they're hypocellular, have a high collagen content. They tend to be low signal intensity on T2-weighted images. That might be a desmoid tumor, for example, that occur in the muscle. Maybe it's just some sort of small fibrous lesion. Chronic hemorrhage, we've, we've seen that already, particularly with that hemosiderin, dark hemosiderin rim around us. So chronic blood products can be low signal on, on T2-weighted images. Mineralized tissue, uh, calcification and ossification. We've seen some examples of that already, how that can be uh, low signal intensity on T2-weighted images. Uh, there's some rare uh, sarcomas, uh, clear cell sarcoma and melanoma um, that can uh, produce melanin that's low signal intensity on T2-weighted images. And of course, you can have foreign bodies, uh, air, fast-flowing vessels, they can result in, in low signal intensity on T2-weighted images. But let me give you some more history here. Patient reported intermittent pain in the lateral aspect of her thigh that occurred monthly and lasted for four to five days each occurrence. Patient denied any prior trauma to this region. And I've heard a couple people say it. Yeah, this was a very unusual case. This was endometriosis to the vastus lateralis, and had cyclic hemorrhage inherent to the endometrial tissue that resulted in these periodic symptoms, and you got this low signal intensity on T2-weighted images due to chronic blood products, and this was taken out, this was pathologically confirmed, not making this up. So there are three theories, I'm getting a little bit out of my league here, but uh, there are three theories of endometriosis, your retrograde menstruation theory, which of course doesn't really readily explain distant extra pelvic endometriosis. Uh, metaplasia, where you have cells lining the pelvis and abdomen that can de-differentiate in functional endometrial tissue, and dissemination of endometrial cells via lymphatics in our blood vessels. But this hasn't been definitively proven, but certainly seems like this would. Uh, so that was just a fun case. I mean, no one necessarily get Okay, now we're getting some history withheld cases. So this must mean their ant minis are close to them. Well, this, is, this, is, this can be a tough one. It's a T2-weighted image of the knee. And here is a T1-weighted image with fat saturation and gadolinium. Yeah, okay, I heard, some, I heard someone say it. So what you see here, which is unusual, is that there's a rectangular focus of low signal intensity anterior to the patellar tendon, surrounded by a rim of high signal intensity. Turns out this patient did a lot of gardening. Um, there's a T1-weighted image with fat saturation surrounding gadolinium enhancement. Again, the, the, the inner portion, the rectangular portion, is of low signal intensity. And so this is what a foreign body is going to look like on MRI. It's most often wood, thorns, or glass. Uh, linear margins are the key in this case. And uh, you can certainly get high signal granulation tissue surrounding. It's going to be bright on T2-weighted images and will enhance. Here's a 56-year-old woman with thigh mass and difficulty bending the knee. This is a nice case. There's a T2-weighted axial image of the upper thigh. I think everyone can see the abnormality here, right? 
Well, let's go down, get another image here. Here's a T1 axial image of the mid thigh. Let's just stare at that for a little while. So we don't have the mass anymore, but uh, I wonder if things look a little atrophic back there in the posterior compartment. Here's a T2 weighted image. The fat saturation is a sagittal image. So maybe things will start coming together here in a moment. And a T2 weighted image, fat saturated image with a cor uh, coronal plane. There's part one, there's part two. And I showed a less severe case of this a little earlier. So let's, let's go through these. T2 weighted axial image shows a mass in the posterior thigh. This will be the last case, with central load intermediate signal intensity surrounded by a ring of high signal intensity. Well, what can do that? Um, nerve sheath tumor can do that. You can have a low signal intensity center with a uh, bright signal around it, so-called target sign due to myxoid uh, material around the, or within the peripheral portion of the tumor. There's a T1-weighted axial image that shows fatty atrophy of the semimembranosus, semitendinosus, and biceps femoris, the hamstrings. Well, hey, maybe this is a nerve sheath tumor that's causing atrophy of musculature. That can, that can certainly happen. I mean, here it is. You have your gracilis, your adductors, your sartorius, your quadriceps. So what's missing? The hamstrings. They're gone. You don't have them. You saw them down more distally. And then here's your T2-weighted image with fat saturation. It shows really this, this high signal intensity is really a cap over this so-called mass that's iso intense to muscle. And the T2-weighted images show fluid and signal intensity beneath the left ischium. And of course, she stated that these symptoms occurred following a fall about a month ago. And this was complete rupture of the hamstring tendons. Not particularly common, but it's, uh, somewhat debilitating, but there's a surprising delay in diagnosis in these patients, as it turns out. And of course, the mechanism is going to be a forced hip flexion with maintained knee extension. So I'm going to stop there because I think it's time for everyone to go to lunch. But thank you very much. Um, this year, I decided to sort of revamp this talk a bit. Um, because of time constraints and everything else. And, and what I did was uh, I decided to, to, to sort of block everything into these big categories. And if you think about it, these are sort of the things that, in a generic sense, happen, can happen to any sort of three-layered tube, which is what an artery is. So we're going to discuss aneurysms, dissection, vasculitis, occlusive disease, hemorrhage, anatomic variants, and AV communication. We're going to start with aneurysms. Now, aneurysms uh, can take a variety of forms or a variety of etiologies, at least, uh, from degenerative, degenerative and infected to traumatic and vasculitic related and even uh, after grafts been placed. The one thing, if you don't remember anything else about aneurysms to take home, is that form follows function, okay? Um, the most common aneurysms you will typically see are going to be the degenerative or atherosclerotic aneurysms, and they tend to take a fusiform shape. Um, they are m more often than not true aneurysms, which means they contain all three uh, arterial layers, the intima media and adventitia, and generally treated only when they're either large or symptomatic. On the other hand, saccular aneurysms uh, are much more ominous, and they tend to be either traumatic or infected. These are typically false aneurysms, which means they don't contain all three layers uh, of the arterial wall, and almost always should be treated irrespective of size. So we're going to start with degenerative aneurysms. Um, as a general rule, what is an aneurysm? Well, most people would say an aneurysm starts when, when the aorta gets above about three centimeters. And from three to four centimeters, um, we typically will watch them and, and maybe not even put them on any kind of serial imaging. Once an aneurysm of the aorta hits four centimeters, they should be followed um, usually every six months to a year with CT or some type of, of serial imaging modality. Even ultrasound can be used in some, in some hospitals. And the indications for repair are if the patient has symptoms, and that's typically pain. Uh, if it reaches a certain size, and that's greater than six in the chest and greater than five in the abdomen centimeters, or if it grows rapidly, and that's greater than a half a centimeter every six months or more than a centimeter a year. Helical CT has, in all re realistically, replaced uh, angiography as the gold standard for the diagnosis and, and sort of the monitoring of um, 
abdominal and, and other aneurysms. So when you see an aneurysm, the things that you want to make sure you include in your report are its location, and that's particularly with regard to the major visceral arteries because that's going to impact the surgical treatment. You want to talk about the size and shape of the aneurysm, the origin of branch arteries, and the presence or absence of rupture or leak is obviously is probably the most important thing. If you do perform arteriography, um, generally, it's, these days, it's, it's performed when you're planning to do an endograft. Uh, and then it's done to make certain measurements to more or less get the graft that's going to fit the size of the aneurysm. You can also do it if you are interested in looking for or treating renovascular hypertension to document any accessory renal arteries that may not have been easily seen on some of the three-dimensional modalities. But aortography really doesn't give an, a an accurate overall size measurement, particularly if mural thrombus is present, because all you're getting is a, is a sort of an a, 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 uh, intramural size of it. Um, if you perform peripheral angiography, it's generally performed with the intention to treat. So there are some old images, uh, chest x-ray, you can see widening of uh, the upper mediastinum, and you can see this large sort of combination, fusiform and saccular aneurysms. Usually when they get to be this size in this position, they're more often degenerative. Here's another one, very large, see it fills up the whole apex of the, of the left hemithorax, and this is a large, uh, again, fusiform aneurysm with a saccular component. And when you see aneurysms of this size, and this is much greater than six centimeters, the, the, the sort of risk of rupture is quite high. Peripheral aneurysms tend to be um, more often traumatic than degenerative, but when they are degenerative, the thing to always remember is you need to look elsewhere because many of these people that develop peripheral aneurysms will also develop abdominal aortic aneurysms and aneurysms in other spots. Here's a 3D gadolinium enhanced uh, MRA of the legs. And again, you can see these long fusiform aneurysms of the popliteal arteries and superficial femoral arteries. Again, this type of technique is similar to an angiogram where you're not seeing the overall size of the aneurysm. You're only seeing the central channel. And you can see that on these axial images where you have, in fact, the central channel here and a lot of intraluminal thrombus around it. So these aneurysms are actually on the uh, right about three centimeters, and these need to be treated. And just a few facts about popliteal aneurysms. Um, they're associated with abdominal aortic aneurysms in 50% of people. So again, if you see an isolated popliteal aneurysm, it behooves you to do a CT of the, of the abdomen and pelvis to make sure that there's not a coexisting aneurysm there. They tend to be more common in men than women. Um, surgical bypass would be the treatment of choice, and rupture is quite rare. Here's another classical popliteal aneurysm on angiography. And this patient also had aneurysms of his femoral arteries and his abdominal aorta. And this is sort of what people would term kind of loosely termed pananeurysmal disease. Some of these people just develop aneurysms everywhere, and there seems to be some type of a gen genetic component with that. Next, we're going to move to graft-related aneurysms, and these can be sort of broken into three different types. You can have a pseudoaneurysm at the anastomosis. You can have an infective prosthesis and a pseudoaneurysm in this area, or you can simply get continued dilatation of the native aorta adjacent to where a graft has been sewn in. So here's an example of an anastomotic pseudoaneurysm. Um, here was the suture line. It broke down, and you see this saccular outpouching uh, right at this level. Here's an example of an infected aortic graft, and there's actually a nice review in this month's uh, gray journal about infected aortic grafts from the Mayo Clinic. They tend to almost always be um, saccular aneurysms. You will often see fluid, or you should always see fluid and often see gas around the graft, and uh, this is a very ominous uh, prognosis. Um, people will term these mycotic aneurysms. That was a term that I think was generated by Osler. Infected aneurysms is probably a more accurate term, but I think mycotic aneurysms will forever be sort of in the nomenclature of medicine, and you should know that just means an infected aneurysm, not necessarily a fungal aneurysm. The surgical emergency, these things tend to be rare. The, the most common etiologies these days are staph, E. coli, and salmonella. Uh, and really, even though you know, the surgical options are the only ones that are really pursued in most cases, um, this is a huge operation and has a very high morbidity and mortality. What you end up having to do is actually excise the graft and do an extra anatomic bypass, usually some type of uh, axillary to femoral bypass. Now there's a couple, few more examples of infected or mycotic aneurysms. You can see this was six months prior to catheter being placed. The catheter is placed six months later. You see this sort of widening of, of the right paratracheal region here. And an ascending uh, aortogram with these large saccular outpouchings. Again, very classical for infected aneurysm. Another example, they all start to look the same after a while, round, saccular, 
exuberant area of the descending uh, abdominal aorta. And this is uh, sort of is a slide I threw in to sort of give you an idea of how fast these things can move. This patient was actually evaluated in the ER for, for, renal, for the possibility of renal uh, colic. And you can see on this, it's very subtle, but there's a little bit of inflammation posterior to the aorta in this area right here. Ten days later, he returned to the ER, again complaining of pain, and you can see over that 10-day time period how fast this has evolved. There's a lot of inflammation now. You can see a saccular component to this. And the angiogram shows this exuberant saccular mycotic aneurysm. Moving to traumatic causes, um, you can either have uh, an aneurysm as a result of blunt or penetrating trauma. Uh, an aortic transection is, is uh, a type of aneurysm that develops from a tear or of usually some sort of blunt trauma, most commonly a car accident these days. Um, this is a surgical emergency because it's a false aneurysm and it has a high propensity to rupture. Uh, interestingly, the most common site is actually at the aortic root, but this is uniformly fatal, so we never image these patients. And as a general rule, uh, over the past five years, chest CT has become the, uh, probably the accepted method for screening for this problem. Again, a uh, patient in a car accident, widening of the upper mediastinum, hemorrhage in the anterior mediastinum, and a typical saccular outpouching of, in, in a classic spot of an aort in aortic transection. Is a more, more, I guess, typical chest radiograph. You see a large uh, right pulmonary lung contusion, chest tubes, multiple lines. Another classic area right at the aortic isthmus. This is where they almost always occur. Here's an example of someone who's stabbed in the back. And this was an, exam, uh, uh, an aneurysm that developed from penetrating trauma. You can see this area is very vascular. Any kind of uh, sharp needle poke or, or a knife to this area can result in these pseudoaneurysms, and this one was embolized. And here was an example of a gunshot wound where you see a rapid flow of blood filling this large false aneurysm. This is what's known as the yin yang sign, or the yin yang sign, where you see both uh, red blood and blue blood on a color Doppler imaging. This shows that the blood is actually cir circling in, the, in a helical pattern. You can see here. Um, it typically indicates either an aneurysm or more commonly a pseudoaneurysm where obviously red blood is blood going towards the transducer and blue is flowing away. Moving on to vasculitic aneurysms. Um, Marfan's disease is probably the most common vasculitis uh, of, that will cause an aneurysm of the ascending aorta. You get what's called annuloaortic ectasia, which if it progresses over a period of time can, can result in aortic regurgitation like this, and you have this spring onion appearance is, is sort of the classic appearance for a Marfan's aneurysm. Here's an example of, of the little microaneurysms that occur with polyarteritis nodosa. You can see them peripheral, they're small, and you really have to look to see them. Polyarteritis nodosa is a necrotizing vasculitis of small and medium-sized arteries. It's associated with hypertension and proteinuria and generally has a poor prognosis. And for those of you that are going to Louisville soon, um, it's important to re remember what this renal microaneurysm diagnosis is. It's a very classical differential. It includes polyarteritis nodosa, metamphetamines, or so-called speed kidney, lupus, and FMD. Proceeding to the complications of aneurysms, um, Three most common things are rupture, thrombosis, and distal embolization. Rupture is obviously a surgical emergency. Um, I think it's always helpful when you're evaluating an aneurysm to do a non-infused CT because it usually gives you some idea of, of a hematoma and how fresh the blood is. Um, sometimes you will be pressed to say whether you think this is actually a contained rupture or a stable aneurysm or a leaking aneurysm. In point of fact, I, I try not to make this differentiation. What you need to say is there's either free blood or there isn't free blood, and give them the sizes of, of the aneurysm and kind of go from there. We'll talk about this draped aorta sign. Uh, this, usually, this just means that you don't see visualization of the posterior wall of the aorta, and it sort of gets draped over the vertebral body. This is a sort of a subtle sign of rupture sometimes. <clears throat> and here's a, a pretty typical illustrative case. You see... Here, free blood in the retroperitoneum, and this is the place where you should look for it. It, it, goes in, it tracks into this posterior pararenal space here and here, and, and you can always tell by just looking at the other side to compare. Okay, it can be a subtle finding, but this is unequivocally a ruptured or leaking aneurysm. If you look here, this is sort of what you see with this draped aortic sign, and we'll show you in this image right here. 
See, the aneurysm sort of drapes around the vertebral body. And a normal aneurysm that hasn't ruptured shouldn't do this. It should be separate. And obviously, uh, if it's not caught early enough, it becomes much less subtle. And you can see here blood filling the retroperitoneum. And sometimes it will actually rupture into the peritoneal cavity. Another example, somewhat subtle, of, a, of an aneurysm that's leaking you can see here this sort of atypical shape going posterior and blood filling this area right around the psoas muscle. And finally, this was secondary to cardiac catheterization. Again, very obvious hemorrhage here, tracking along the extraperitoneal space of the pelvis, going down to the groin, large hematoma deviating the bladder to the right. And if you look closely, you can see the pseudoaneurysm was actually caused by a high uh, arterial puncture. So distal embolization uh, is another complication of aneurysms, and in this case, the aneurysm serves as a source of the emboli. This can be treated either with a surgical bypass or sometimes a covered stent. And the differential often is between things that affect those small arteries, but you should always remember that, that a proximal aneurysm can cause this type of appearance. So here's an example of that. You see an aneurysm in the forearm, and the distal outflow has completely completely been occluded, or it's called trash. You can have trash hand or trash foot from just multiple emboli over, over a long period of time, occluding all these digital arteries, and you can see he's already had amputations. Next, we want to move to dissection. There are two classification schemes. Ignore the DeBakey scheme. Use the Stanford scheme. It's very easy to remember, and it also implies both prognosis and treatment. A type A aneurysm is any aneurysm that involves the arch, and it's a surgical case. Type B aneurysm is an aneurysm, or is a dissection, excuse me, that doesn't involve the arch, and it's treated medically with vasodilators and beta blockers, unless there's some other complications such as mesenteric or renal ischemia. Um, on chest X-rays, you can look uh, for displaced calcifications, and they're often best seen if you have serial films. It's kind of hard to diagnose on a single film, I would argue. Um, CT and MRI, again, are becoming the gold standard for the diagnosis of this. Again, you can look for these centrally displaced calcifications. You can look for a peripheral density of, of, high, of blood, which is a hematoma. The most obvious finding, and I think probably the thing that everybody's familiar with, is when you see dual lumens with a flap, or you can see flow voids or thrombosis. On angiography, there are numerous signs which uh, I think angiographers are familiar with, including just difficulty in both moving the catheter around and the catheter taking an abnormal position as it travels through the aorta. Um, you can have apparent wall thickening. You can have this double barrow aorta or linear, linear lucency or flap, or even obstruction of the major branches. So white blood, sagittal image, MR. You see a nice dissection flap. I think, again, this is what everyone's familiar with looking at. Similarly, on a T1 or a black blood image here. And on the corresponding CT, again, a nice large flap with true and false lumens. There's a uh, ascending aortogram. You see the catheter travels up here. Instead of hugging the posterior wall of the aorta, it's deviated medially so, you, medially, so you know that there's something abnormal already. And then you're filling here. The true lumen or the false lumen usually fills in a delayed fashion through these small fenestrations that almost always occur in the dissections. This is uh, a non-infused CT, and this is, I think, very helpful to look at uh, and look for these intimately displaced calcifications. Here you can see one that's displaced from the wall, so you know this crescent of high density is actually blood within the wall. Some people would call that an intramural hematoma. Some people call it a, a, an aortic dissection. It's kind of semantics. The, the bottom line is there's blood in the wall of the aorta, which is abnormal. You see it's a little more difficult to diagnose that on the contrast enhanced view, simply because you, know, you wonder, is this just some atherosclerosis and an aneurysm? You, it's hard to see the calcification because of the presence of contrast. <clears throat> And this is just a, a blown up view of another patient, similar thing. Calcification here, lucent, or a crescent of high density here. This is blood in the wall of the aorta. And this is something that, that you should obviously uh, recognize because it has a very ominous prognosis. Uh, it's somewhat subtle, and, and I, I show it just to sort of drive this point home. Again, a crescent of high density here. It's actually not as high density as the contrast, but it's very abnormal. It's, it's not what you would typically see from, from atherosclerotic plaque in this area in the ascending aorta. And that, in conjunction with a hematoma or, or hemopericardium around the heart, shows that this dissection is propagated to the root and, and ruptured into the pericardium, and that's for blood, and this is a surgical emergency. On angiography, a descending aorta, I mean, you could, sometimes I like to show this case simply because it's hard to recognize occasionally that you don't see any of the visceral vessels in it, and it's not sort of immediately obvious to everyone. 
that this is an aortic dissection simply because you see a large false lumen filling here. Here's the true lumen and here are all the vessels. It's a good way to show it as an unknown. And of course, dissections can be focal. And this is just an example of a focal type B dissection that's thrombosed. Moving on to vasculitis. Uh, Takayasu's is, is probably the, the most important one to know about. We'll also discuss Berger's disease briefly. Here's a classic example of Takayasu's. You almost always see it in the vessels off the arch. You see these long or short segment narrowings with skip areas, and that's sort of the hallmark of Takayasu's. Similar again, aortic arch, long segment narrowing with more normal caliber vessels above and below. This is a so-called bald aorta sign where actually all the vessels become occluded off the arch. So what is Takayasu's? It's a chronic inflammatory arterial disease. It's, it's classically a young woman, although it does not have to be, and it usually involves the abdominal aorta and main brachycephalic or visceral branches. People have called it pulseless disease because when the subclavians get affected, you, know, you don't propagate a pulse to the wrist. Um, you can have hypertension or lower extremity ischemia from it. And again, the hallmark is these diffuse these are, are these diffuse stenoses with skip areas. And in the chronic stage, you can try angioplasty, but this is generally not recommended in the acute stage. This is an example of Berger's disease. What you typically see is just occlusion of, of all of the vessels down in the hands and feet and many small little corkscrew collaterals. Here's an example in the legs. This is what's called Martorell's sign, which basically means that there is a corkscrew collateral along the course that you typically see a normal vessel, in this case being the posterior tubular artery. Berger's disease is also called thromboangiitis obliterans. It's an inflammatory vasculitis. It's classically in men, although uh, that's prob that demographic is probably changing as, as there are more women smokers. Typically in young pe people, it can be in the upper or lower extremities. It kind of just depends on who you read, which is more common, but you'll see it sometimes in, in both the upper and lower extremities. And the hallmark is that it occurs in smokers. And it actually is more common overseas in places like India where they smoke particular types of uh, tobacco that, that has a high incidence of this. And they get claudication, thrombophlebitis, and arterial ulceration. So this affects both, both the arteries and veins. We're going to move on now to occlusive disease, which is probably the most mundane and common, and we're going to talk about briefly atherosclerosis and, and uh, emboli. Uh, the thing to remember about peripheral vascular disease or chronic limb ischemia or atherosclerosis, it progresses through a very predictable uh, set of symptoms. It starts with claudication or walking pain. As it gets worse, you will progress through rest pain. You may then go to tissue loss and ultimately gangrene. In terms of treatment, uh, it's very controversial whether you need to treat claudicants with anything besides exercise and medicine. Um, some people do, some people don't. Once they progress beyond this stage, there uh, is no controversy, and everyone agrees that that, and that's once they, they come to the point of rest pain, they need to be treated either with an interventional dilatation or some type of surgical bypass. <coughs> Emboli uh, have other names, such as blue toe syndrome and trash feet, uh, and the di diabetes can also affect the smaller vessels. Here's an example of an evolving aortic occlusion with central atherosclerosis. This pattern of atherosclerosis tends to be uncommon, but, but does occur in some individuals. This is a much more common pattern that we're used to seeing, uh, involvement of many of the distal vessels. This is Lerich syndrome. The image on the left is a uh, gadolinium enhanced breath hold MRA. The image on the right is a uh, abdominal aortogram obtained from a, of a, from a brachial, actually this one is obtained from a uh, left common femoral approach where we just push through the occlusion. Lerich syndrome is uh, buttock claudication, impotence. It has other symptoms um, and is treated usually with an aorta biofemoral bypass. Again, for the people that are going to be going to Louisville, you need to know these collaterals. The easiest way to remember them is to break them up into compartments. There's an anterior compartment, which you often don't see on imaging unless you uh, do an angiogram of the thoracic arch, where the, co the collaterals via the internal mammary to the inferior epigastric, the external iliac arteries, the middle root is the IMA to the superior hemorrhoidals to the internal iliac arteries, and then the posterior root is the, po the subcostal and lumbar arteries to the deep serpentiflex iliac arteries to the external iliacs. And here's showing an example of the, the posterior pathway. Okay, subcostals and lumbar branches that come down, connect to the deep circumflex iliac, and then to the external iliac. And the middle pathway, where you see the inferior mesenteric artery coming down, and then this hemorrhoidal plexus, the superior hemorrhoidal off the in uh, the in a inferior mesenteric artery and the uh, inferior and uh, middle hemorrhoidals off the internal iliac artery. Notice again that you don't see that anterior pathway because we're not injecting up in the arch. 
renal artery stenosis, uh, again, another, cause, another problem with occlusive disease. You can have atherosclerotic that usually affects the proximal part of the renal artery. The mid part's usually affected by either FMD, sometimes Takayasu's, and the peripheral part can be from FMD or polyarteritis nodosa. And point of fact, atherosclerotic disease is probably most common in all three areas, although if you see sort of these isolated things, you should think about other etiologies. Typical example of atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis, very tight osteo lesions, which are very amenable to percutaneous dilatation and stenting. This is an example of the beaded appearance, which is classical for FMD. Um, in a patient that has emboli, the most common thing and the thing that you should first think about is emboli from the heart, whether it be from AFib or from uh, a patient who's had an MI and has a left ventricular thrombus. Again, as we saw earlier, you can have emboli from an aneurysm that's proximal, or it can be from some of these repetitive trauma states, and we'll talk about uh, hypothene or hammer syndrome briefly. Here's a cardiac embolus. This is what you look for. It should be asymmetric. It's an abrupt cutoff. You don't see any well-developed collaterals, and this sometimes you will see a little meniscus right where the clot would be. Okay, This is classic for an embolus. It doesn't look like anything else. Another embolus. This is a hypothenar hammer syndrome, and what this is caused by is chronic and repetitive trauma to the ulnar artery over the hypothenar eminence. It usually occurs in uh, patients who do this um, in some type of occupation, whether it be you know jackhammer workers or construction workers, people that use that part of their hand to pound things. What happens is this artery is affected by FMD. The repetitive trauma causes it to thrombose and subsequently send emboli down to the digital arteries. Again, ulnar thrombosis over the hamate bone due to repetitive trauma. Uh, the underlying problem is fibrous dysplasia, and the treatment is a surgical bypass. Next, we're going to proceed to hemorrhage. And the types of hemorrhage we're going to talk about are the bronchial arteries, uh, gastrointestinal bleeding, and pelvic trauma. And bronchial arteries are variable in their distribution. They typically originate around about the level of the carina. There's usually three total, but there can be four, there can be two. They can originate off any other area there. And they can result in some patients who have either cystic fibrosis or TB, sometimes neoplasia, life-threatening hemoptysis. And life-threatening hemoptysis is uh, defined as bleeding more than 500 milliliters in a 24-hour period. And it usually causes death not by exsanguination but by asphyxiation. Here's a descending thoracic aortogram, and you can see abnormal vessels to the apex of the left lung. This is the corresponding bronchial arteriogram. Again, a lot of abnormal vasculature in this patient who had hemoptysis. You often will not see active bleeding, but just this is enough to, to uh, proceed to embolization. It's typically embolized with a combination of, uh, of either gel foam or gel foam and PVA. And you can see here is initially, and this is what we did after embolization. Moving on to, upper, uh, to gastrointestinal bleeding, the way it's broken up is either upper GI or lower GI bleeding. Most bleeding is in the upper GI tract, and it's typically caused by either ulcers, some type of gastritis, or some tumors. And endoscopy is the initial both di diagnostic and therapeutic option uh, and, and treatment of choice. Um, once you get beyond the ligament of trites, you, you move to the lower GI tract. Things like diverticula, angiodysplasia, and tumors are more, cause, are more common for causes of bleeding in the lower GI tract. Um, interestingly, Bleeding diverticular are more common on the right, but I would argue since diverticular are overwhelmingly more common on the left side of the colon, most of the bleeding diverticular that we see are actually left-sided. Uh, if you see angiodysplasia, it typically occurs in the cecum and ascending colon, and it's in older patients. In terms of the workup of uh, GI hemorrhage, I think the initial imaging study should be a, a nuclear or a tagged red blood cell study if the patient is stable enough to go through that. It tends to be more sensitive than the angiogram because you have a longer imaging window. On angiography, you look for things like a tumor blush. You can see pooling in a diverticulum, or you can see an early draining vein in an AVM. But in point of fact, most of the time when we see GI bleeding, we cannot diagnose the uh, exact etiology. So a couple examples of GI bleeding. Here's bleeding from the left gastric artery. And again, you often don't see active hemorrhage, even though this may have been seen endoscopically. If they see bleeding in the fundus of the stomach, we usually go in with the intention to treat irrespective of where we, whether we see active bleeding or not, and we will embolize the left gastric artery. Here's an example of a bleeding duodenal ulcer. This is a selective injection into the uh, proper hepatic artery and into the GDA. You can see this little blush here persists through the venous phase, and that's what you're looking for for act active GI hemorrhage. 
And of course, this one we just embolized with a combination of coils and gel foam. And this is the final angiogram. This is an example of what angiodysplasia looks like. You see this tangle of vessels, and the hallmark is this large, dilated, early draining vein. Here's an example of a diverticular hemorrhage. Again, you usually just see pooling. It persists through the venous phase of the study. This is after we've embolized it with microcoils. This is a catheter we used to catheterize the IMA, and this is the microcatheter. Those are the coils. For those of you who aren't familiar with this, uh, these are little smaller catheters that are available, uh, which actually go through a diagnostic five French catheter, and they have these tiny guide wires, and you're able to put tiny coils, and you can get much more peripherally and into much smaller vessels than you could in the past. Now we're going to move to pelvic trauma. This is a typical case, plain film, patient on a backboard. Um, you can see pelvic diastasis, fractures of, of the uh, left femur. This is the corresponding CT, where, again, you see uh, sacroiliac joint, hemorrhage, hemorrhage. Very classic pelvic trauma case. This is the corresponding angiogram. A couple of things you'll notice. Uh, and it's a young person, yet there's not a lot of flow through the internal iliac arteries, which shows that these arteries are in vasospasm and the patient is probably in or near shock. It's a pseudoaneurysm here of the left internal iliac artery. And on delayed views, you see pooling at, uh, in the corporate cavernosa. Now, this can be a normal finding, so you really have to correlate this with a CT. Uh, in this case, this was actually active bleeding, but it can be difficult to tell sometimes. So we injected a combination of gel foam and packed it up with coils on the left, and then injected a uh, small slurry of gel foam on the right. This was the final angiogram. Another similar example, older case. Again, you see a fracture there. You see an AV fistula there. And the interesting thing is actually what you don't see on this. You don't see the internal pudendal arteries. You don't see the, the uh, inferior gluteal arteries. So these are all in, in spasm. And again, in this case, we injected a combination of gel foam slurry with a few coils to back it up. A few things about pelvic trauma embolization. Um, first of all, the most commonly injured arteries are the internal pudendal and superior gluteal arteries. The first line of therapy is an external fixation. Basically, they just want to try to tamponade the hematoma and get the vessels to, to, to uh, sort of stop bleeding on their own. You don't want to do a surgical exploration because all that serves to do is uh, decompress the hematoma and worsen the bleeding. And then the patients that aren't cured by external fixation will go to embolization. <coughs> The agent of choice by most people is gel foam pledgets, either a slurry or pudding, and coils. Um, and as a general rule, you can embolize both internal iliac arteries with, with gel foam, uh, a gel foam slurry in a young person without ischemic sequela. And in these cases, you want to sacrifice sort of elegance for speed. You want to just get the, the embolic in and stop the bleeding. You, know, you don't want to sort of su super select every bleeding artery and try to embolize it. It takes too long. Next, we're going to proceed to uh, anatomic variants. Um, Anatomic variants can consist of both normal anatomy, and I'll talk about the mesenteric arteries, or abnormal anatomy, and we'll talk about a few compressive syndromes. So there's a large anatomic variation between the celiac and the SMA. In fact, only 60 people have what's called a normal distribution. You can have a replaced right hepatic artery from the SMA in 10 to 20% of people, an accessory right hepatic in 10%, and a left hepatic arising from a left gastric in 25%. And there's many more sort of other variants which are much less common, but these are the ones that you probably should know about. So here's a conventional celiac anatomy. Splenic artery, left gastric artery, which you may or may not see very well. It's not, it's not, a, it's not unusual not to see it hardly at all. Common hepatic artery, the GDA comes off that. The short segment is in the proper hepatic artery, and the bifurcation into the right and left hepatic arteries. So here's an example of a replaced left hepatic artery, replaced off the left gastric artery, segment two and three. Here's a conventional uh, superior mesenteric arteriogram. And this is an example of a replaced right hepatic artery that comes off the SMA, feeding the entire right lobe of the liver. This, on the other hand, is simply an accessory right hepatic artery. You see it feeds part of the right lobe, but not the entire right lobe. Now, you can also have sort of these anatomic variants that are pathologic, and, and probably the most common one is thoracic outlet syndrome. And this can be both uh, arterial, it can be venous, or it can be neurogenic. Neurogenic is actually the most common. 
that's typically exacerbated by arm abduction, but just that finding on an angiogram is not enough to make the diagnosis of uh, thoracic outlet syndrome. You need to have the clinical sequela. You can look for cervical ribs, and the typical treatment is an anterior scalenectomy and a first rib resection. So here's an example of an arterial thoracic outlet compression. You can see a little sort of divot or abnormality in the, in, in the subclavian artery on the left here. The arm's abducted, nearly completely occluded, lots of collaterals everywhere, well-developed. So you can see this is a chronic, long-standing process, and they all look almost exactly like this. This is another type of an entrapment. This is called popliteal entrapment syndrome in a neutral position. This is a, a 3D gadolinium-enhanced MRA. And in a plantar flexion, you see complete cutoff and no, no flow beyond the, uh, the popliteal, actually a distal SFA in this case. Here's this angiogram of the same patient. Neutral, you see nice flow beyond this. And in plantar flexion, a large divot taken out of this area. So what causes popliteal artery entrapment? Essentially, it's an abnormal relationship between the artery and the medial head of the gastrocnemius muscle. You can have a, a variety of variants. You can have accessory muscle slips. You can have little ligaments that are compressing it or little these compressive bands. And what happens is the repetitive arterial compression and trauma leads to aneurysm and thrombosis. So sometimes you may see just that second picture I showed you a second ago. So I'll go back for a second. This one right here. You see that picture. The differential includes a partially thrombosed aneurysm, popliteal cystic disease, and entrapment. And again, that's a, dif a differential that people that are going to Louisville should know about. Uh, you want to do the angiogram in both the neutral and stress positions, and the treatment is typically surgical. Another compressive syndrome, selective superior mesenteric arteriogram with retrograde flow of the GDA into the liver. That usually indicates a problem with the celiac. And here it is on inhalation, narrowed but relatively normal. On exhalation, a tight band pushing down on this. This is the immediate arcuate ligament. Okay? Again, this is another example of 5 to 20% of normal individuals will have this finding. And just the finding alone is not diagnostic of the problem. The syndrome itself is controversial. In fact, some people think that the artery is just a marker of it. And that the real problem is the fact that the ligament compresses the celiac ganglion. It's associated with weight loss, gastroparesis, and abdominal pain. Um, and you can look for collateral arterial blood flow from the SMA to the celiac. <clears throat> Interestingly, the, the compression is actually exacerbated in exhalation, which is kind of counterintuitive for some people. Uh, and the symptoms are, again, usually alleviated by a surgical release. Finally, uh, and briefly, we're going to go through uh, an arteriovenous communication. Um, you can have abnormal connections between veins and veins, for example, the portal vein and the hepatic vein, but the one I'm going to talk about is artery to vein. Uh, they can be congenital, and that's typically called an arteriovenous malformation rather than arteriovenous fistula, or they can be acquired. And these days, they're treated with either embolization or typically a covered stent. Here's a typical example of that. This was a, a low catheter placement during a uh, code. Uh, you can see when you inject the artery, blood comes down and then goes up the vein, so you have an early filling vein. In this case, we got across the area and opened up a stent that actually has lining on it, so a so-called covered stent here, and you can see this sealed the hole. And that's it. Thanks. I'm going to be talking about arterial intervention um, from the aorta to the toes. And I think before starting uh, any talk on arterial intervention, we basically have to answer this question, the most commonly asked question among, amongst uh, interventional radiologists these days, how do we compete? They're increasingly involved in decisions in the management of patients basically by necessity because formerly that was done by the clinical services and basically we have to create a patient population for ourselves in order to have a niche to do arterial work. IRs compete with cardiologists and surgeons and how do they do this? They either join cardiologists and surgeons by having vascular centers or you create a patient population for yourself either by having admitting services in clinics, or I'm sorry, having all of these things, admitting services in clinics, active screening programs like the Legs for Life program where you acquire your own patient base, um, providing pre-procedure, intra-procedure, and post-procedure care uh, for your patients and following them up uh, yourself. That was formerly, um, pla that burden was formerly placed on the clinical services and it can't be really done that way anymore. And tracking outcomes, morbidity, mortality, just like a surgery service. So. Once you do that, uh, you have a fighting chance to basically doing peripheral arterial work. And then you have to learn about PAD. And what I mean by that is uh, you have to 
learn when to treat patients. Formerly, uh, surgeons would decide when, when and what to treat, uh, and you have to be able to do that for yourself. You know that, uh, as Brian was mentioning, it commonly presents with claudication um, and sometimes presents with ulceration, ischemia, rest pain, more severe, uh, and even threatened limb. And it's surprisingly uh, common among the population. And how common? Uh, well, as you can see, patients over 70 years old, one out of every 20 has intermittent claudication. So that's actually reasonably common in the population. And based on non-invasive testing, peripheral arterial disease is prevalent four times that number. So should you intervene on all those patients? That's the question. As he mentioned, intermittent claudication, probably not uh, all those patients. Um, and a lot of ram rambunctious uh, uh, physicians will treat anything they see that looks like it's um, uh, stenotic. And uh, you shouldn't rely on other clinical services for treatment decisions. And I say other because we are becoming a clinical service. So should we treat patients with threatened limb? Definitely. But intermittent claudication, definite maybe. And that's because 75% of those patients will improve with exercise and cessation of smoking within 6 to 12 months. So if you treated them and caused a complication, you might have done them a disservice by intervening at that time. But if you don't treat these people, you, get a, you, you do them a disservice. 25% will progress to severe ischemia uh, with a 6% likelihood of amputation in greater than 5 years. So you have to decide for yourself who should be screened uh, and who should be treated based on severity of symptoms and physical findings, age, cardiovascular risk factors, comorbidities like coronary artery disease and stroke, and then compare those uh, findings on your individual patient to publish recommendations, and they do exist. A lot of it is in the vascular surgery liter literature, like the TASC study, which tries to make predictions on outcomes based on uh, presenting, presenting findings uh, of your patient. Comorbidities, remember they will inf influence treatment selection. Some patients you may not want to do uh, angioplasty or stenting on based on severe coronary artery disease or uh, risk of stroke. Um, those other comorbidities tend to cause mortality among these patients, and they actually have patients with peripheral arterial disease have a high mortality rate. Lower ex extremity ischemia, 30% five-year mortality, and patients with trifurcation disease, 45%. And patients with diabetes or renal disease do much worse than other patients. Those are things to bear in mind. So having said that, I'll just go through angioplasty in order, uh, top to bottom. Starting with just a brief history, you know that it started in 1963, first coaxial dilatation of the superficial femoral artery. And the first catheters were designed for balloon dilatation in the early 70s. And it wasn't until really the 80s that the hypothesis for successful angioplasty was developed and histologically. And that includes fracture of the intima, media, and plaque, and dehiscence of intimal medial junction. So it's basically like a controlled dissection that you're creating with angioplasty and hoping that it doesn't propagate to become pathologic. And you, you have stretching of the adventitia, adventitia, which can remain permanent. And healing occurs over basically three stages, acute, subacute, and chronic. Acute in a day or so is the platelet phase, and that's the reason why you might want to use uh, antiplatelet therapy in the acute phase to avoid uh, early thrombosis at the angioplasty site. Uh, Subacute, two days to five months. That's where smooth muscle uh, regenerates, as, as does endothelium. Uh, and if that uh, is exaggerated, you can have the chronic exaggerated response at five to six month mark that causes re stenosis for, uh, with intimal hyperplasia. And here's an example this is an SFA. Uh, you can see there's a lesion here, a lesion, lesion here. I'll just go through the technique uh, briefly. Screen the patient before, so make sure you're doing the right thing for the patient and discuss it with them. Um, is, are the indications good ones for doing angioplasty as opposed to another type of treatment? Focal stenosis or occlusion, and I'll go into these in a little more detail in a second. Good runoff, or if these don't exist, is the patient not a surgical candidate, and so they're relying on you to perform some intervention? Or is it a bypass graft stenosis? Uh, contraindications, things like stenosis adjacent to an aneurysm that might increase the risk of rupture, and acute occlusion that will increase the risk of embolus, and blue toe syndrome. You know, these patients typically have um, iliac plaques, and they're sending 
clots down to the foot, uh, trashing the foot. That's a relative contraindication. I only mention that because people have successfully treated these with stents, but you really don't want to angioplasty them alone. And then establish goals so the patient can have some realistic idea uh, what they're going to get out of the treatment. Um, is it relief of intermittent claudication? We already talked a little bit about whether or not to treat those patients. Um, or is it something more severe, rest pain, non-healing ulcers, or the worst case scenario, like infrapopliteal angioplasty is often performed just to salvage a limb from ulceration or to heal an amputation. And then consider surgical options as primary caregivers for patients with peripheral arterial disease. You have to accept this responsibility um, and uh, Possibly bypass graft or atherectomy might be better than uh, the minimally invasive treatments you're offering. This is our patient. These are a couple of tandem lesions in the SFA, and I'll talk about tandem lesions a little bit later on. So before you do angioplasty, think pharmacology. Give heparin prior to crossing the lesion. A lot of people forget. And secure vasodilators you might need along the line if you have vasospasm. And select your wire. Um, preferably a floppy-ended wire like a Benson or a large J wire uh, to avoid dissection. Um, and you might have to use for occlusions hydrophilic glide wires. Um, and uh, the balloon length should bridge the stenosis if possible, and that it prevents shearing uh, of longer uh, lesions that could propagate a dissection. Balloon diameter should be 15 to 20% larger than the estimated size of the normal vessel. Evaluate for success and complications, and I'm going to talk extensively about complications, but success on the SIR definition, uh, less than 20% residual stenosis, less, less than 10% residual pressure gradient, and an ankle brachial index improvement of greater than 0.2, and see there was some degree of success for the top lesion here, a little residual for the bottom, but acceptable. And then again, think pharmacology at the conclusion of the procedure. Is this the kind of patient that you should give antiplatelet prophylaxis, either by aspirin? And remember, aspirin is a very cheap drug. Uh, it's pretty widely used. It can inhibit platelet aggregation up to 14 days after administration. Uh, and then a host of antiplatelet drugs. I'll talk about them a little bit at the end. Or is this a patient that should be coumadinized? Complications. There are a whole host available to you if you're going to do angioplasty, including puncture and angioplasty site complications. I'll go over them starting with puncture site. This one being the most common, requiring therapy hematomas, less than 1.5% uh, of cases. Uh, retroperitoneal, retroperitoneal bleed can lead to massive blood loss without visible changes at the puncture site. So a common thing is patients go upstairs, they start bleeding uh, after you've removed the catheter. Uh, so it's something that you have to recognize. And when you're accepting these patients as the primary caregiver, you need to do very good uh, close follow-up of them on your own instead of having a clinician call you with the complication. Uh, and the risk is obviously increased if the puncture site is not over the femoral head or the patient's anticoagulated. The other puncture site complication, spasm, kind of a spectrum, spasm occlusion, possibly due to thrombosis. Uh, it's actually fortunately very low incidence, uh, but not in patients who are having access into smaller arteries like brachial arteriography or angiograph uh, angiography in children. Uh, and there was a cardiology study that showed diminished or lost pulses in up to 20 to 25 percent of children having, angio, uh, and having angiography on removal of the catheter. Even though those are self-limited, it is kind of important to recognize that in case you're going to have a case of occlusion. And you treat them with vasodilators, obviously. And then this is the case Brian just showed. Uh, arteriovenous fistula, most of them connect the deeper superficial femoral artery with communicating veins of the thigh, or in this case, the uh, femoral vein here. This is an SFA to femoral vein, can cause claudication steel, uh, and uh, can be treated by any of these things. Hopefully, you can do embolization or a covered stent placement um, uh, in patients who are not really good surgical candidates. Sometimes these are treated by surgery. This is, again, that case, deployment of the covered stent successfully, leaving open the profunda femoris. There's another complication, pseudoaneurysm at the puncture site associated with low femoral puncture uh, and uh, associated with groin hematomas. And there's a risk of rupture if these are left untreated. You really have to do something about them. And what do you do about them? These are what we can do in radiology. 
and uh, I'll just briefly mention those in a second, but surgical repair uh, is usually required if they're chronic, supraingual, or infected, although the supraingual ones we can do with thrombin injected on, injection on occasion. Infected ones, a lot of times it ends up being an extra anatomic bypass with an on-block resection. And this is an example of ultrasound guided manual compression. Put the ultrasound probe over the pseudoaneurysm. Watch for 15 to 20 minutes while you have color flow on. Hopefully when you release the aneurysm, the pseudoaneurysm is thrombosed. Uh, you repeat it as much as you can stand it. Success rates are 90% without anticoagulation, which are actually very good. They go down with anticoagulation. Or you could try this method, percutaneous thrombin injection. You do 500, 500 to 1,000 units per mil injected into the apex while watching under ultrasound via a skinny needle. And usually it's a rapid result uh, by ultrasound with some studies showing a low to no incidence of distal embolization with this, uh, uh, with this treatment. And then stent graft. And the problem with stent grafts, grafts is lots of times these things occur where you're puncturing like the common femoral artery and that's a flexible location and the long-term uh, patency of stent grafts is questionable, and some early studies showed high occlusion rates. On to angioplasty site complications. <clears throat> Serious complication rates, uh, death, operation, delay, and discharge is actually under 5%, but that's actually a reasonable number. So you have to be prepared to be able to handle these uh, uh, precipitously if they occur. Um, this is probably the classic angioplasty site complication. Not always a real complication. This is a uh, intimal flap from a dissection. Uh, and what, how do you treat subintimal dissections? You put a balloon back up across here first um, and leave it up for a while. Hopefully you'll tack down that flap. If it's a persistent flap after you take back down the balloon, uh, you might consider stenting, and that's if there's diminished flow. Uh, if there is no diminished flow, you might want to leave it alone, especially in infra uh, inguinal angioplasty, where stenting might have a lower patency long term than just having left this alone. So consider very strongly that it's not diminishing flow and leave it alone. If wire access across the dissection is lost, and I'll show you a case of that, consider uh, a retrograde approach, like from a popliteal approach, if it's an SFA uh, approach angioplasty. And that is to avoid getting a wire in here and propagating this section further and making matters worse. Sometimes you can weasel a wire in there very easily. This is another case uh, of an angioplasty site complication. Little lesion, or multiple sort of moderate tandem lesions up and down this SFA, but that was the most uh, obvious one. And after treatment, the resident, you can blame it on the resident, has pulled the wire back across the lesion, reshot an angiogram. You should never do that. For all cases, you should leave a wire across, inject through a sheath or through an alternative catheter site uh, when you're uh, checking for complications. In this case, there's occlusion at the angioplasty site. Uh, thrombotic occlusion, it can also be a dissection. Uh, under 5% in some series, less than 1%. It depends on the patient population, obviously. Uh, risk is increased for long lesions, external iliac as opposed to common iliac lesions. And if there's poor runoff, remember sluggish flow equals thrombotic occlusion. Consider antiplatelet therapy after medium to small vessel angioplasty for this reason. And in this case, we were able to get a wire back across and stent the patient. Um, you can also try suctioning through a catheter. That's been described in the literature. Uh, and thrombolysis may not work for these patients. Sometimes this is a platelet thrombus, uh, in fact, very commonly, because that's, remember, the first phase of angioplasty healing is platelet uh, deposition. Distal embolization, I'll just briefly mention, less than 5%. Uh, really, a lot of, a lot of uh, studies show less than 3%. Probably more common, but subclinical. And the reason I say that is uh, in the carotid scenting literature, they now use these protective devices. Uh, there was a reasonable incidence of uh, embolization to the head. And uh, even in those asymptomatic patients, you can see findings on MRI that suggest there were some uh, subclinical embolis emboli. Uh, and if you predilate occlusions, uh, you can send chronic material down the extremity, so you should pr probably try to avoid that uh, significantly if you can uh, and primarily stent those patients. Pain may or may not be a complication. Sometimes it's just an indication. Uh, it's common during inflation of the balloon and arterial angioplasty and results from stretching of the adventitia. But it can herald that you're at the limits uh, that the vessel is going to tolerate. 
Uh, so you should avoid upsizing the balloon after pain is induced. And if severe or persistent pain uh, is experienced after taking the balloon down, uh, it suggests dissection or rupture. You should get an angiogram as soon as possible. Make sure you've left the balloon across the lesion. And every IR suite should have some kind of covered stent available these days or an occlusion, a high compliance occlusion balloon that you can get back up there uh, if necessary. And this is just an example. There was a little lesion up here and down here in the uh, common and external iliac artery. After angioplasty, doesn't quite look good enough here and, and here. So repeat angioplasty is performed, and boom, that does not look very good. That, this patient uh, expired from this procedure. Um, and that's important to recognize these patients are exsanguinating on the table as you speak. You have to get something across this very fast. Uh, if you don't think you have a lot of time because it's a major rupture, you can put your angioplasty balloon across this uh, and put it up lightly to try and tamponade. You should have a high compliance occlusion balloon ready. Uh, and in this, this case, it might be a perfect case for emergent uh, covered stent placement. I'll show you get covered stents in a second. Uh, and you should always call a surgeon in this case, bite the bullet. Uh, incidence is fortunately very low for arterial angioplasty, probably lower than you might expect with overdilatation. Uh, risk is increased in high dose steroid uh, patients. Arterial inflammation or vasculitis cases, remember that a lot of them are treated with high dose steroids, so these can be in combination. Wait, to the, wait till they're treated to completion before you uh, do anything like this. Acute infection or aneurysm, you can increase rupture. FMD, don't overdilate these patients. You know they're going to do well with angioplasty, so why overdilate them and, and possibly uh, cause a risk of rupture? And balloon overdistension or balloon rupture, remember to get the air out of the balloon when you're doing angioplasty because that can cause reverberation against the arterial wall if it ruptures. So how do you tell that the patient is rupturing? Typically persistent or intense pain, diaphoresis, bradycardia, this is a vagal reaction. Maybe the patient might need atropine in this case. Decreased consciousness, and occasionally no symptoms at all. Reinflate the balloon, call surgical backup, consider covered stents like this one, the wall graft uh, by Boston Scientific. And then finally, cholesterol embolization. This is a catastrophic uh, occurrence that can be result from angioplasty. Uh, lower limb levito reticularis, kind of a blotchy, purpley look uh, to the lower extremity, uh, indicating severe ischemia. But the patients might have preserved pulses, and that's because a lot of these little cholesterol emboli from the plaque go very far distal to the arterial or small, small artery branches and occlude. <clears throat> Just specifically a little about aortoiliac intervention. The role of thrombolysis, uh, most people would agree, acute occlusions less than 14 days expose the underlying lesion, um, and so you can do appropriate treatment based on the appearance of the underlying lesion and prevent distal embolization of the acute thrombus for angioplasty. Uh, Subacute occlusions often stented primarily to avoid that distal embolus. Uh, but some uh, people have reported lysis uh, of these patients in the third or fourth week to aid reversal of difficult lesions with a wire. And then chronically, in the order of months, you really have no potential benefit for uh, doing lysis. <clears throat> now, outcome of angioplasty alone, uh, five-year patencies are now available for most types of angioplasty. Uh, you can see that the range is pretty high, 54 to 93 percent, and that's because all the studies are different. Patient selection is different. Um, and a mean over 2,000 cases in one review showed 72 percent uh, five-year patency, and really the better lesions are going to be in the 80s these days. Um, and no good studies include all comers with the intent to treat, and that's the reason for that huge disparity. Uh, angioplasty of occlusions, it's known they have poor results. It's just not done. You stent those patients. Stenting, uh, the long-term patency is similar to angioplasty alone for simple lesions, and I'll show you what those are in a second. Uh, and it's improved for complex lesions and occlusions over PTA. Uh, but most investigators still recommend PTA, and this is kind of an economic principle. You don't want to put a stent if you don't have to and waste the money. Um, for short lesions under three centimeters in the iliac system, it's defined as a short lesion. No calcified eccentric plaque. Uh, and it's a stenosis, not an occlusion. So then you put a stent in for suboptimal or complicated result like a dissection. Occlusions, 
complicated or long lesions, and patients with blue toe syndrome becoming an indication. And stents, there's just a host of stents available. Uh, you'll be inundated by various uh, stent reps, but I'll just go back over briefly. The wall stent being the self-expanding poster stent and Palmaz being balloon expandable. Both are approved for iliac use by the FDA. Self-expanding stents like this one are more flexible. This is the wall stent by Boston Scientific, made of braided stainless steel, kind of sharp edges. A lot of people think that uh, some of the newer stents are going to avoid restenosis at the top and bottom of the stent because they don't have those sharp edges, but that remains to be seen. Uh, it foreshortens, so it's not resident proof. It takes a little uh, uh, learning, uh, an operator cur learning curve. Uh, but the good thing about it is it's recapturable, it's flexible, and it comes in a covered version to prevent uh, patients exsanguinating during rupture or to exclude pseudoaneurysms. This is covered with polyethylene tetrafluoride, uh, which is a uh, graft material. This is a, an example of using one in the subclavian artery pseudoaneurysm exclude that aneurysm, successfully preserving the uh, outflow to the vertebral artery. And then another si uh, set of self-expanding stents is the nitinol stent, made of the same thing as the nitinol filter, nickel-titanium alloy. Uh, it foreshortens very minimally, but still not resident-proof, not recapturable once you start to deploy it. These little Z-shaped segments come out one by one, and they're only attached by little tiny struts here and there. So. They can't be uh, recaptured. Has more radial force than the wall stents and greater wall apposition. And the significance of that is uh, people think that uh, not, not having wall apposition, uh, having the stent opposed to the vessel wall, uh, can lead to thrombosis of the stents uh, over time. So greater wall apposition may diminish that, and that also remains to be seen. More flexible, as you can see here, uh, and higher midterm patencies uh, uh, than uh, first-generation stents. Here's another example of a nitinol stent, this one by Boston Scientific. Uh, it's the Symphony stent. I'm just using that as an example. One of the downsides of nitinol stents, those are all upsides, but the downside is you can't see them very well. The Symphony puts little radiopaque markers at the top and bottom, um, but they, it's similar to a filter, a uh, nitinol filter, you can't see them as well as stainless steel. Balloon expandable stents, uh, like this uh, Palmaz stent, are the most radiopaque of all stents. And they have hot, excellent radial force, so for that reason they're used for renal osteolesions. This is basically a metal tube with slots cut into it, so-called slotted stent. And when you uh, balloon it open, it becomes diamond-shaped uh, interstices. Just that all-familiar aortoiliac bifurcation lesion, the so-called kissing balloon or kissing stent. Uh, this is where you have a ledge or uh, a high lesion in the um, common iliac ostium. Uh, and you're worried about angioplasting it, that you might cover the other uh, common iliac ostium with that uh, plaque during angioplasty or with uh, stents during deployment of, that, of a unilateral stent. Um, so you want to protect the contralateral, even healthy uh, common iliac ostium by deploying bilateral stents here. The only reason I mention controversial is uh, some studies have shown now uh, pretty reasonable success for a lot of common iliac osteal lesions putting in a unilateral stent uh, if you're careful and you do it from a, an ipsilateral approach. So some people would argue with the efficacy of it, but a lot of people still do it and argue for it. This is the result in our patients of bilateral stent placement. Here is a left common iliac uh, total occlusion. And uh, if you go to Louisville, don't say that this is a surgical patient. You can drill through these uh, pretty effectively and uh, stent them. Factors improving stents in the iliac arteries, a patent superficial femoral artery is one of the best. So no tandem SFA lesion. Patency, three-year patency can be reduced up to 75% in the presence of a tandem SFA lesion after you do iliac plasty. <clears throat> Stent diameter of greater than eight millimeters. Remember, the, uh, the greater that you can expand, the better. And the use of a single stent so you don't uh, compromise the lumen diameter. Five-year patency rates, I'm going to move on to femoral popliteal outcomes, um, and we've seen a case of that. Uh, angioplasty of stenosis and angioplasty of occlusion. In patients with good runoff, five-year patencies are these. A little bit less than uh, uh, iliac uh, angioplasty, but still uh, reasonable. Angioplasty of occlusions, uh, not the best. 
And that's, those are patients with good runoff as opposed to patients with poor runoff uh, where those numbers go down considerably. In surgical bypass five-year patencies, this is basically what would be the alternative treatment. It's important to remember that 80% five-year patency is seen with vein grafts. So if the patient has a good vein for a bypass, uh, you might consider that before you would consider uh, doing angioplasty of a simple lesion with good runoff. Uh, and that decision might come down to patient preference uh, or other surgical issues. Uh, 30%, 38% five-year patency with synthetic graft, like Gore-Tex. So that does worse than uh, angioplasty in pa patients with good runoff. So probably angioplasty is the better option there. What causes poor patency after FEMPOP PTA? And there are some studies, like the STAR Registry, and people at Penn have looked at that, uh, seeing whether or not uh, there are certain factors that pretend to a bad outcome or a good outcome after femoral popliteal angioplasty. And for an example, three-vessel runoff, patients with three-vessel runoff do eight times better than one-vessel runoff with disease. So the outflow is kind of important. Patients with multi-level disease or patients in whom you're treating tandem lesions like the one we saw before do worse than single lesions. Eccentric calcified lesions or long lesions, and in the SFA, long lesion uh, is defined as over 10 centimeters. And patients with diabetes do five times worse than non-diabetics for similar lesions in the femoral popliteal circulation and renal failure. The role of stents, uh, controversial because stents reduce the vessel diameter and are thrombogenic, as we said, if incompletely opposed to the uh, vessel wall. So PTA has remained up to now the treatment of choice in infrainguinal angioplasty. And stents have been used only for these reasons, which we're familiar with. And first-generation stents, wall stents, palmas, uh, the long-term patencies were not much different from PTA alone, and obviously they add expense to the procedure. Uh, but lately, night and all self-expandable stents, like the smart stent that I showed you, uh, have been having very promising results, midterm results uh, in infrainguinal angioplasty, better technical success, lower complication rates. Uh, and one study showed a three-year patency rate of 76%, which is very promising uh, th that it's going to be a little bit better than the result we saw for FEMPOP lesions. And then finally, infrapopliteal lesions. These patients are typically treated for limb salvage. Um, and uh, you don't treat them for long-term patency. So you're not going to resolve their claudication. Uh, basically, you're trying to heal an ulcer, heal uh, a distal amputation, something like that. Um, and technical success is very high. Um, some people actually have used stents, uh, tiny stents in these patients. Uh, limb salvage rates, 44 to 85%. Uh, it's pretty good when there isn't a good alternative. And finally, on to the possibility of doing anticoagulation after PTA. Should all patients be anticoagulated after angioplasty or stenting? There's ongoing data that's pretty strong for antiplatelet therapy uh, in patients who have small vessel and, or middle-sized vessel uh, angioplasty or stenting. Aspirin has been the mainstay. It's cheap. Response uh, is not 100%, so you might have to add some other therapy in some patients uh, with high risk. <clears throat> Uh, Plavix is a pretty common one. It inhibits uh, platelet ADP as its mechanism. Uh, reduces, has been shown to reduce short-term occlusive events more than aspirin, so more effective than aspirin. Uh, and since it it's, has a different mechanism of action, it can be used synergistically with aspirin if necessary. Uh, but the long-term patency in peripheral arterial disease is uh, yet to be uh, discerned. Uh, there's one up here that's called Reapro. It's another. It's 2B, uh, 2A3, 2B3A uh, inhibitor. It's an uh, adhesive um, receptor on the surface of platelets that this uh, Reapro blocks. It's also called uh, abcitimab. Um, and uh, in car coronary studies, they've used triple dose or triple drug therapy for some uh, high-risk patients using all three drugs. But I think it's going to, the jury is still out for <clears throat> the utility of these drugs, especially if they're expensive in all patients. Coumadin, it's been shown to have no improvements uh, overall over aspirin uh, for peripheral arterial disease patients uh, and obviously has greater risk. And it's reserved for patients at high risk for thrombosis, hypercoagulable patients, patients who have thrombosed arterial bypass grafts multiple times might get coumadinized. So other treatments, finally, for PAD in the past and on the horizon. 
These things you have probably heard about or hear about, um, they tend to be expensive percutaneous atherectomy devices, transluminal endarterectomy catheters, rotobladers, laser-assisted angioplasty. Uh, not much advantage over PTA, and especially when you consider the uh, economic uh, disadvantage. So what's on the horizon? Cutting balloons, just now starting to come out for sizes that would be appropriate for peripheral angioplasty, peripheral arterial disease. Uh, they have thin cutting wires on the balloon for those lesions that are refractory that cause uh, early technical failure. <clears throat> Endoluminal radiation brachytherapy to retard intimal hyperplasia and prevent that six-month uh, exaggerated reparative response or intimal hyperplasia. Um, this is either radiation delivered by a, a wire or delivered into a, by a substance uh, into an angioplasty balloon. And we'll see the results of that as uh, it's currently investigational. Drug-eluting stents, um, they elude drugs like sirolimus or paclitaxel uh, to slow the growth of intimal hyperplasia, similar to slowing the growth of neoplasms, uh, similar idea, and hopefully these will have uh, utility in those smaller or middle-sized vessels. And cryoplasty, very new. Uh, some companies are coming out with this. Cold angioplasty, and we'll see if that has any uh, long-term uh, utility. Purely investigational. And that's all. Thanks for your attention. Um, Non-vascular non interventions uh, encompass a wide range of procedures, you know, something from very uh, fancy like affibration uh, to something mundane but very useful like abscess drainage. Um, today I will focus on abscess drainage, um, percutaneous biliary intervention, and uh, percutaneous nephrostomy catheter placement. Um, the good news is that the uh, Cardiologists and the vascular surgeons have no interest in abscess drainage, so we still rule the field. Um, just a brief introduction. Uh, since 1938, not much has changed in terms of uh, criteria for ideal abscess drainage, which is directness, simplicity, and avoidance of um, uninvolved areas. Uh, with the development of ultrasound and CT in the 70s, um, percutaneous procedure uh, started taking off. and. Uh, Ron Vall in 1977 reported the first uh, ultrasound guided uh, percutaneous drainage. Um, pre radiology, um, just to put things into uh, perspective, um, the uh, mortality rate for undrained collections was 80 to 100 percent, and the surgical management, uh, the mortality rate improved to 30 to 40 percent, so it still wasn't um, very good. There are many uh, advantages to the uh, percutaneous drainage of abscess. Uh, very high success rate and an acceptable uh, complication rate with a very low serious complication rate. Um, it's a mil minimally invasive um, procedure. Uh, we don't use general anesthesia in general, but in pediatric population, you might want to consider using uh, anesthesia. And uh, the cost is uh, greatly reduced compare the surgery. Uh, the whole goal of putting in an abscess drainage catheter is to uh, um, get complete cure. However, that's not always possible. In a small percent of, percentage of patient, um, you're not going to get the result you want. And however, you do allow the patient to stabilize, um, get them uh, over the hump of being really sick, and have them undergo elective procedures as opposed to emergent procedure. And uh, you can also reduce the number of surgical interventions. Uh, at our institution, sometimes we do a combined uh, radiological or surgical approach, uh, such as in the case of um, diverticulitis complicated by an abscess. Uh, I'm going to go over some uh, technique. Uh, some of you probably know this already, but it's a good review. Um, which modality should you use? There's ultrasound, CT, MR. Uh, we like to use ultrasound when possible because it's quicker. Uh, but to be safe, um, in many instances, you need to use CT guidance. And there are two basic techniques, the trocar technique and the uh, Selinger technique. Um, the trocar technique, um, what it does is you uh, have the inner stylet with a sharp needle, and then you have an outer catheter. 
and you um, puncture the abscess cavity after making a nick in the skin. Uh, you plunge the whole uh, set into the abscess, and then you uh, deploy the uh, cavity. Uh, we use this technique in very superficial lesion or um, in patients who are very sick and cannot come down to the uh, interventional suite. Um, usually those patients are the ones that are in the ICU where you have no uh, philosophy to help you out. The Selinger technique, on the other hand, uses a small needle and then a series of, of exchanges to uh, get the catheter into place. Um, very basic uh, tools that you need for this procedure. Uh, you need the guy wire. Um, you need the uh, puncture needle. Uh, that's a micropuncture set, but you can use an 18-gauge uh, single wall puncture needle. Um, and then you upsize it to the right wire. You use this wire here. This is a J wire. And then you dilate up the tract with seven and nine dilators, and then you put in your catheter at the end. Uh, which size do we use? We usually use a small size, eight French, for a simple fluid collection, as in lymphocele, a uh, very um, uncomplicated collection. For bigger catheter, you need to use a bigger size. For example, pan pancreatic abscess may require the, you to use a 14 French. You may want to start out with a 10 French and then upsize it as you need to. Um, another case uh, where we use the trocar technique is a uh, cholecystotomy tube in the unit. If the patient is too sick to come down, um, you just bring the ultrasound machine up there and then you puncture the gallbladder and then advance the uh, catheter in. Um, you can use uh, Dawson Mueller, which is a smaller uh, catheter, or you can use a Turner pneumothorax kit to do this. Um, catheter care is very important. Um, especially now that uh, the billing for catheter placement has been um, devalued somewhat because they know that you have to uh, write uh, a follow-up um, statement in the chart so that you can charge for um, e and m coding. So basically every day you have to uh, evaluate the catheter. You look for the output, and then you have to assess for patency position and uh, irrigation, I'll get to that. And uh, depending on the patient's condition and the clinical situation, you may have to re-image if necessary. In general, when you um, put the catheter in, it should not be irrigated for the first 24 to 48 hours. Um, this is because uh, you risk sending the patient into septic shock. Uh, after 48 hours, you can start irrigating the catheter with 5 to 10 cc's of normal saline. Um, collection with debris, such as in a pancreatic abscess, require more frequent and more uh, vigorous irrigation. How do you know whether the catheter is not working? The, um, you can tell by uh, if there's leakage around the catheter at the skin site and if there's a certain decrease in drainage without clinical improvement. Um, sometimes the catheter can migrate and if you have a multi loculate fluid collection, you might drain one collection and the remainders in there are not connected and you might uh, have to manipulate your catheter. And then if you need to uh, place it more than one catheter, then by all means, uh, do it. Um, as far as uh, lysis of uh, abscess fluid collection, the uh, TPA or urokinase uh, are being used, although urokinase is the only one that's approved for this indication. TPA is not. Um, there are currently a few studies going on, including one at Northwestern. Um, about the use of TPA. But we find uh, using four to six milligram of TPA diluted in 10 to 20 cc of normal saline, and then you inject it through the catheter, cap it for four hours, and then um, after the four hour, you uh, put the catheter to gravity drainage or bulb suction. Uh, to be prudent, you want to use the same contraindications as uh, for use of uh, arterial or venous lysis. Um, when you remove the catheter, uh, really look at the patient. If the patient is doing well, um, feeling better, having increased appetite with the lab that goes along with it, then chances are you can pull it. However, we do not pull any catheter until the output is less than 10 to 20 cc's per day for a couple of days. And then if you have any question, you can always re-image because you don't, want to, you don't want to take the catheter out and then find another collection and then have to put the catheter back in. Um, just a, a quick case study. This patient had two catheters placed. It's a Crohn's patient. And uh, in one, uh, one catheter has pretty uh, good decreased 
uh, drainage out to day 20, down to almost nothing. The other catheter kept going. So what should you do in this case? Um, you can re-image, which we did. Uh, it showed no collection uh, at the tip of both catheters, so we decided to take this, uh, the catheter that's indicated by the yellow bar here out. And we brought the patient back for an uh, injection through the other catheter, and sure enough, there's a fissure to the small bowel. And what should you do in this case? You should put a pigtail just about a centimeter away from the fissure, put the patient on NPO, and allow the fissure to heal. Sometimes it takes up to two months, but eventually uh, most of these patients heal over. Uh, just a few specific indications for abscess drainage. Uh, first one involves the liver. Um, pyogenic is the most common. Um, amoebic uh, usually requires aspiration. You can also drain bilomas, infected hematomas, and infected necrotic tumors. Here's a patient, uh, a 30 year old man with um, um, acute onset of fever, chills, um, and elevated white count, et cetera. Uh, no history of um, uh, neoplasm. So, you know, looking at the CT, you can't really tell whether this is some kind of necrotic tumor or what, but based on the clinical history, we put a needle in and got out pus, so we put in a drainage catheter. Um, a note of sound guidance, the um, uh, abscess is usually very, vis very visible in the liver, and then you can see the catheter coming in here. Um, after you place the catheter, we try to suck out as much uh, pus as possible. Um, hepatic abscesses, a few um, points. Uh, antibiotics alone in amoebic abscess usually suffice. Um, aspiration, aspirations alone in small abscesses, you don't have to put in a catheter. Um, liver abscesses in setting of ascites, uh, it's a relative contraindication, although uh, you can drain the ascites completely and then go after the abscess, but in those cases, we don't like to put a catheter in uh, because you can seat the peritoneum, so you just want to go in with a small needle, aspirate as much as you can, and then get out. Um, Low, very low complication rate with echinococcal cyst drainage. Uh, when I reviewed the literature, there was a, one paper with 150 cases uh, of echino, uh, echinococcal cyst drainage, I think in China, and only three minor complications. Uh, none of them were uh, related to the anaphylactic shock that we like to associate with echinococcal. Here's a CT with a big echinococcal cyst with a few dollars dollar cyst adjacent to that. Um, Pancreatic pseudocyst uh, uh, drainage uh, sometimes can cause a problem. Um, the pseudocyst is a um, wall-off collection that is made up of pseudo-epithelial layer without true epithelial lining. Um, the, la the one larger than 5 cm are prone to bleeding, rupture, and uh, infection. Um, the infected pseudocyst required emergent uh, drainage, uh, which is curative in 90%. Um, the non-infected pseudocyst drainage is very it's controversial, but our indications are we would drain if it's larger than 5 cm and is associated with some kind of symptoms. Um, it shows interval enlargement or if there's extrinsic compression or pain. A very good uh, success rate, uh, 89 to 90 percent, for infection for uh, drainage of a non-infected pseudocyst. Um, Surgically, you have to wait a six-week period, and there's you know similar recurrence rate. Uh, these are some of the complications associated with percutaneous drainage of uh, non-infected pseudocyst. Here's a, a case of a patient who had pancreatitis and developed a uh, uh, infection of the pseudocyst. You can see gas bubbles within the collection. So how sh how should we approach this uh, uh, abscess drainage? Uh, we couldn't find one really, unless yet you, you go through the uh, stomach, the anterior and uh, posterior wall of the, of the uh, stomach, and we don't like to do that very much. So what the GI people can do is they can put down an endoscope and uh, look for the bulging um, abscess posteriorly, uh, and then puncture that and put in a drainage catheter. So. Um, that's one way to approach it. Uh, there are some people report in the literature of going trend gastrically, but um, you know you might have to put up a tack to tack up the stomach, and it gets very complicated. So we try to avoid doing that. We just refer this patient to our, our GI colleague. Uh, here's another patient uh, with um, um, 
pancreatitis and uh, pseudocysts anteriorly here and a few other collections. And one of the collection has very high uh, hyperdense material within it. And then the patient was actually infected, so we drained the other collection and the surgeons wanted us to go after this collection. So, um, so anytime you have hyperdense material within a pseudocyst, you have to think of uh, um, pseudoaneurysm or a hemorrhagic pseudocyst. And you don't want to you don't want to stick this if the if it's a hemorrhagic pseudocyst uh, and it's acute because it, the patient will continue to bleed out the tube. Uh, and also you don't want to stick a um, pseudoaneurysm. So you have to be very careful about uh, what case you're doing. In this case, we waited, and then the, the cyst didn't get any bigger. Uh, there was an evolution in the uh, density of the material, so we felt it was safe, and we uh, drained it after several days. Uh, pancreatic glucosis and abscess um, has a very high mortality rate. Um, percutaneous has a very decent uh, cure rate. However, you do need, again, to use large bore catheter, and you have to irrigate this uh, vigorously. Surgery is associated with high mobility and high mortality. Uh, splenic abscess, um, usually these happen in uh, the pediatric population in patient uh, with uh, sickle cell anemia, et cetera. Um, the success rate is pretty high, 76%, and uh, uh, among the report complication, pleural effusions seems to be the most uh, common. Uh, I thought maybe bleeding would be a big complication, but it turns out it wasn't. Um, other enteric abscesses, uh, uh, peri uh, uh very good success rate. And like I said before, the peri abscess can be combined with surgery. Um, the peri abscess, the question is whether there should be an uh, appendectomy that's performed afterwards. And, you know, from talking to people at Children's Hospital and, and so on, I think uh, probably they should get uh, in an apodectomy because uh, they can recur. Uh, you drain the patient, the patient gets better, and then, you know, the fecal lift, whatever, stays stay behind. It's going to cause um, reinfection. So probably the uh, appendix should come out after drainage. Um, a variety of conditions uh, can cause pelvic uh, abscesses. And um, with the pelvic, the important um, point is which route should you take? And I, I list it in this order. First, you try transperitoneal, then transgluteal, then tra transvaginal, then transrectal. Transrectal and transvaginal have very high success rate uh, and low complication. However, with the transrectal, you better be sure that the patient does have an abscess and not like a pelvic cyst that you're going to infect by going through the rectum. Transvaginal, um, it can be very difficult because the vaginal lining is very tough. It takes a very stiff wire and a lot of dilatation to get through. Um, transgluteally, uh, the MGH study came out last year. They um, reported 154 procedures in 140 patients with very high success rate. Um, and if you go below the piriformis, um, then you have a decreased incidence of pain. However, even if the patient has pain, 82% of these resolve within the first 24 hours with uh, analgesic, so it's manageable. Um, however, you do have to um, avoid the vessels in the nerve um, by using CT. You always have to use CT if you're going to go transgluteally. And to, when you remove a transgluteal, transgluteal catheter, make sure you remove it over the wire because um, one of the cases, they, they, they had uh, bleeding complication after removal, and I think that was attributed to uh, yanking out the tube. Uh, when you put the Y in, you unform the pigtail loop, and then it slides out rather than um, roughing the soft tissue on the way out. So here's a woman uh, with uh, four-week post C-section, fever, leukothesis, and abdominal pain. Um, Here's a collection there. Here's a uterus. The bladder is in front. And here's a rectum posteriorly. If you have any question about uh, whether a collection is the bladder or uh, an abscess, put it in a Foley catheter. That answers, usually answers the question. Uh, here's another a cut lower down. In this case, we, uh, here's the bladder anteriorly in the, on the ultrasound, the uterus, and the collection posteriorly. 
Um, how do we do a transvaginal or transrectal abscess drainage? We used a uh, ultrasound probe uh, with a condom on, and then we uh, affixed this 18-gauge uh, needle. It could be any 18-gauge needle. It doesn't have to be a uh, cookie cut, but that's what we use. And we uh, tie it down with... Um, uh, we, we, we tie the uh, needle down so that it doesn't move, and then we introduce the whole system into the vagina or the rectum, and then we look for the collection, and then we advance this needle anteriorly into the collection. And then you dilate up the tract, and then you uh, put in your wire. Here it is. The wire within the collection opacified with a little contrast there. And then you put in the catheter, 